Hi, this is Jeff West with Oracle, and today I'm going to be giving you an overview and a demo of a feature in WebLogic for highly available JMS called Store and Forward uh, on the client side. The Store and Forward client has the same concept as the server to server Store and Forward, except messages are stored on the client. Uh, and forwarded to the JMS destination when that destination is available. The client does not have to be running in a J2EE container. Um, it can be a standalone Java program, and that's what I'm going to show you for this example. First, what I want to do is run the setup example script for the SAV client. This is going to execute some WLST to create a JMS module and deploy an MDB, which takes some messages off of the uh, queue that we're going to export for the storm for a client and displays the message to the screen. So now if we go back to the console, uh, the admin console, we'll see that there's a new JMS module for the storm for a client. And here I've got my connection factory and my two distributed queues. If we look at the export queue, under the advanced section, we'll see that the SAF export policy is all. And if we go back and look at the no export queue, we'll see that the SAF export policy is none. So and this specifies whether a user can send messages to the destination using store and forward. Also, while we're here, um, in case you haven't seen these in the admin console, when you click on more info, it will pull up a uh, another tab or another window and it will give you more information about the setting that you're looking at. So here's the SAF export policy and here's the options and it tells you whether it's dynamically or statically configured. If it's dynamic you don't have to restart the server versus I think static you I think it's called static you have to restart the server. And also it gives you the MBean attribute for this uh, whatever setting that you're looking at to help you learn WST better. The next step towards having a JMS Storm for client is to generate the Storm for client configuration file. In order to do this, you start with the JMS module configuration file and uh, run a command that generates the uh, file for you. So in your WebLogic domain directory, here I have the AppGrid domain, there's a config directory and then a JMS directory under that. And here we have our client configuration. And if we take a look at that, you'll see that many of the parameters or many of the options on the in the JMS configuration file map to the same MBeam properties we were setting before. So it should be, this is a fairly easy, easily readable file uh, if, you're, if you know what you're looking at. So let's take a look at the command that we use to generate the Stormford client configuration file. Um, here we specify the URL, username, and module file, uh, and an output file where the client config will be generated. You can also find this client config file in the code package that you can download from samplecode.oracle.com. So let's go ahead and execute the command. First, I want to call the set domain env script to set up my environment. Then we need to go back to the config JMS directory and run the command. There we go. Now we've generated our file. Let's go take a look at it. So here we go, let's pull it up. So here we have the connection factory and the queue that is there. And remote context that specifies the destination URL and the username. You'll notice the password is not here. That's because we don't want to store it in plain text. And I'll show you how to generate an encrypted password uh, in a few minutes. But you'll notice here that the, the regular queue that we specified the SAF export policy as all is included, but the other queue where we specified none for the SAF export policy is not included. So next we'll take a look at generating the encrypted credential file for uh, the client to use. 
Actually, before we proceed, I want to show you a uh, I want to show you a configuration parameter where you can specify the persistent store on the client side. By default, it will it will create directories under the current working directory when you execute the Java program, but you can override that using the store and forward configuration file. Um, so let's look at how we do that. So this is where you would um, put that information. Let's go ahead and for this example, I'm going to put it in the my uh, client directory here, so we can uh, take a look at it once it's once we start creating messages. Of course, we need to change the backslashes to forward slashes to make Java happy. And there we go. That's how you add your persistent store and specify the information. As far as synchronous write policy is concerned, we're going to disable that. Uh, I think it's cache flush is the way that uh, it defaults to if you don't do this. For more information, you can look on the default store operations for uh, persistent stores. So now let's generate the encrypted credential that we can provide for use with the client. So here, the password key, this is the client-side password that they will use to access uh, the password for to use remotely. So for simplicity, uh, we'll call this password-key. And the remote password is welcome, welcome1. So now we have an encrypted password that we can go back and add to our store for client configuration. So under our SAF login context, we have a username, and then we'll go ahead and paste in the encrypted password here. So now the store for client configuration is ready to go. Um, and next we need to look at the jar files that are needed for the store for client. So the jar files are available from the Oracle middleware home directory under WebLogic server, server, lib. And I've pulled the three jar files that are needed into a lib directory for the store and forward client. However, since WebLogic is licensed software, uh, we can't distribute these in the example code um, because the example code does not have a license. Or rather, it doesn't have the same license as uh, WebLogic. So let's take a look at the code that I'm using in my uh, SAF client producer. We'll see that it extends the WebLogic JMS producer. You don't have to use the WebLogic specific classes. I just chose to because I've put a lot of work into this class, uh, cleaning it up and making it good for examples. We'll see here that the SAF initial context class file is a little bit different. It has a SAF client string in the uh, package name. And we have to, when we create the initial context factor, we have to pass in a config file in the password key. So here's the code. Let's take a look at the hash table. When we set it up, we're using the SAF initial context factory. For the provider URL, we're passing in the file name. And then for the security credentials, we're passing in the password key. This will, this is the password that's used to unlock the encrypted password that is sent over to the JMS destination that's used to connect there. So it's a secure way of providing out the SAF client configuration file without exposing your credentials that you're using on your server. So other than creating the initial context factory differently, the rest of the code that you'll find in this class is similar to all the other classes. Um, just creating a producer and sending a message batch and that's going to create a connection in session through the connection factory and then uh, send messages to the final destination. So let's go ahead and uh, show a demo of that. I've got my admin server running in this window and my manager server is not running. So what I'm going to do is run this class and we'll see what happens. So without the remote destination running, uh, the client won't know the difference, the actual client code, and it will happen in the background with the uh, the SAF client code, the WebLogic code, will manage the sending of the files. So here we see the client is trying to send the files. It opens the connection, 
creates a session in a, in a producer um, as it normally would and closes the connection. And so those messages, if we look at our directory here where we specified for the persistent store, the messages are stored in this file, this data file here. It's a file store. So here we'll see that the connection cannot be made, and of course it can't because it's not running. So this is going to continue to run in the background um, until the managed server comes up, and when it's available, then it will finally send the messages over. But what I'm going to do now is uh, kill this process and restart it. And the reason for doing this is to show you that between executions, the messages are persisted. So here, the second time I started it, it has recovered 10 persistent messages because those messages weren't able to be sent the last time the program was run. So I'll go ahead and resume this. And in the meantime, I am going to start my other managed server, or my first managed server. So one thing to, to note when you see these uh, when you see the message here waiting to synchronize with other running members of the cluster, what this is doing is it's the members of the cluster are coordinating with each other um, by by default they're doing consensus leasing. Uh, so there's a cluster master and it's communicating with the other members of the cluster so they know if they can resume the lease that they had for the services that they are running. Um, like the migratable JMS targets, for example. Okay, so now my manager server is up and running. And we'll see here that with the remote context was able to be created. And here we'll see on my managed server that the messages have been delivered. So I've got the first 10 messages from when I sent it when it was down the first time. And then I have the next 10 messages for a total of 20 that were... Um, sent on the next execution. So thanks for stopping by. Uh, hopefully you've found this demo and overview useful and informative. If there's anything you would like to see, please leave a comment on our YouTube channel or send us a direct message or tweet including the hashtag weblogic uh, string. Thanks.